Welcome to Let's Chat About, the free monthly webinar series hosted by Sophia Sees Hope. We've developed the series with those living with LCA and IRDs in mind, but it is open to anyone who's interested in what's happening in our communities. My name is Alyssa Bass, and I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications for Sophia Sees Hope. Before we get started, I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors for this series, AGTC, Dominion Energy, Janssen, Mira GTX, Procure, and Spark Therapeutics. We could not provide programs such as these without their support. A few housekeeping items. This session will last about 45 minutes. You can submit questions through the Q&A function. We did collect some questions in advance from the registrations and we will take those first. As time allows, we will take questions that come in live. We are recording this session. After the webinar, we will post the recording to our YouTube channel and send out the link. It's my pleasure today to welcome Dr. Edmund Chen, Vice President of Clinical Development Ophthalmology and Hematology at Editas Medicine. Dr. Chen oversees an exciting and emerging portfolio that spans the therapeutic areas of hematology, oncology, ophthalmology, and neuroscience. As a physician executive with more than 20 years of combined clinical and industry experience, he has a track of success at companies including Merck and Bayer. His therapeutic area and drug development expertise is deep and diverse, from rare disease and indica indications such as bronchiotactasis, vasculitis, and pulmonary hypertension to large cardiovascular areas, including congestive heart failure, thrombosis, and therapeutics for primary and secondary cardiovascular prevention. Welcome, Dr. Chen. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you for all the great work that you, you, uh, your group, you and your group is doing in uh, promoting the science and awareness. It, I think it's a, a great chance. And thank you very much, uh, all, all of you guys, for spending time uh, and uh, joining the session. Well, so thank you very is, much. So oh. my name is Edmund Chan. Uh, I'm a board certified cardiologist. Uh, in been doing this for uh, for a long time now. Uh, and I actually I have a passion in the, in innovation. I started, you know, the, do, do, um, an industry trying to develop uh, life-saving treatments, and uh, fortunately, been able to be part of the development of a number. Uh, in fact, that uh, we just worked on the uh, a, a new generation of and uh, of antiplatelets, sort of new aspirin, and in fact, uh, it's also gone against aspirin. Uh, and more recently, I've come to a realization that uh, you know we probably don't need another aspirin and there's a, uh, uh, and it's time for some sort of uh, delivering life, life uh, saving treatments to um, pivoting to life altering, you know, the therapies such as what we are talking about today. And then the, uh, the, the my passion for innovation uh, has led me to Editas uh, Medicine and uh, a, a great company that's uh, behind the discovery of Edit 101. And uh, Editas Medicine uh, founded in 2013, and we have been at this journey on LCA10 since 2014. And uh, today we're going to touch on a little bit about the science, a little bit about the the results. Mostly, hopefully, have a conversation and try to inspire and um, you know and promote hope. I think without uh, you guys, uh, without uh, patient participating, uh, we just can't do what we do. So we're very grateful especially for someone like myself who's very humbled uh, in uh, you know, being afforded the opportunity to test these uh, important, uh, uh, <clears throat> important medicines, which uh, <clears throat> serves not only the sort of foundation of what, what we see today and what's to come tomorrow. And it's actually a very exciting time. So there are so many types of gene treatments out there today, and it can become confusing to the lay person as they navigate the, the language and the news. Explain to us what CRISPR is. CRISPR, uh, as a technology and discovery, actually won, uh, won the, uh, the Nobel Prize, uh, in the, for which the Nobel Prize was awarded in chemistry in 2020. This is how important the CRISPR technology is. It, in, in a, a, a sort, of, sort of basic level, it's actually fairly simple. It's a mechanism that bacteria have developed you know, that in response to viral attacks. And the CRISPR, if you think, I actually brought props today. Hopefully you guys can, can see and imagine, so I brought some Lego blocks. 
Um, and if you imagine Lego blocks as the building blocks of life, right? You know, a blueprint from which, you know, the, everything, all the proteins come from, you, you could imagine sort of in the, in the case of CRISPR and what we call a guy RNA. So the, if DNA is a template and it's a blueprint, blueprint the flip side of the, uh, uh, of the DNA is the RNA. And for the RNA, there is so-called a guy. So a ruler, if you will, something, something that comes in and recognizes very specific portion of the gene that allows it to come together and with a, with a new, with a mechanism called Cas9 or Cas protein, which is an enzyme that actually does the cutting and fixing. So that's what we call the editing part. So if you, you know, if for example, again, this is part is the DNA where the guide RNA, the ruler, if you will, recognizes the DNA comes in and you have the Cas protein, the nuclease, which is attached and allows it to cut and, and do the editing. So the process, it's, it, it, in, in the process, the, G, uh, the DNA is actually edited with the gene defect corrected. So it's a very different methodology as you know, the more conventional gene therapy where a entire protein is actually introduced, uh, entire, entire gene uh, uh, product is introduced. In, in our case, we take out the abnormal part and put in the what's normal and in restoring the gene function. So it's a very elegant use of science, again, for which the Nobel Prize was given. So this is a big deal. But in order to, we are one of the few companies that can do this in so-called in vivo, within the body and outside of the body. So we have technology and platforms that allow us to do that. And we are actively looking at developing uh, new therapies, you know, across the areas, as you, as you had noted earlier, in, uh, in oncology, in, in blood, of course, in ophthalmology, and in this particular case, the LCA10. So CRISPR is a form of gene editing. Correct. And gene editing is different from gene replacement, as you just said, because with CRISPR and gene editing, you're not removing anything and putting something new in. Am I right? So if you can imagine the, the editing process is a, it's, it's cut and nip in it uh, and cut. And there, there are different ways in which you can do, but at the end of the day, what you are trying to do is to make changes in the actual DNA so that you correct the function. R remember to, uh, in this, you know, we're limited by the current technology in which the, the editing apparatus, so all the tools that we, we, we put in, we have to package it somehow to get into the cell. And this, uh, all this uh, goes into the virus and the virus in fact transfects or infects the cells, allowing the apparatus to be introduced. When you talk about a gene, depending on the size and the complexity, it's not always that simple to be to get into the cells and also you don't know where it goes but with our technology because of our specific guide the ruler or the recognition system we know exactly where it goes and only makes the changes that we want so it's a very efficient and precise process that the uh, that's lacking in some of the other the treatments and I guess it makes sense that it's perfect for something like Leber congenital amaurosis, which is a single gene mutation, right? So you just have to identify that one gene that has gone off the rails and introduce your, your um, therapy there. Correct. In fact, with, you know, as, you, as all of you know, the mutation causes abnormality in the splicing where the, you know, the DNAs cannot be you know, cannot be joined and where, you know, a functional protein can be formed uh, or can be produced and, uh, and therefore leading to the, the loss of vision. So 
in that, with our therapy, this could be corrected. And of course, we're very excited that recently we believe that we have demonstrated that in the in patients. And one so, thing I would add is, you know, through how this discussion, we want to make sure people understand, um, you know, a bit of a disclaimer that we're all the invest, you know, we uh, the, our trial is ongoing. It's a current investigation. We're not making any claims. And, uh, and results can be variable. But we, again, we are, uh, we are excited that with the results that we, we do believe for the first time we've seen editing in, uh, uh, in the eyes. Now, I, don't, I usually save questions until the end, but a question just came in which speaks to the conversation we've just been having. So the question okay. is, does the injection restore gene function to the whole retina or just a small part of the eye? So this, this the therapy in itself is limited by the way it's delivered. So it is delivered through so-called subretinal injection. So a, uh, a fine needle is, is uh, placed into underneath the, uh, the, the retina, creating sort of a so-called blab, allowing the, uh, the actual uh, solution or the edit 101 to go inside and penetrate the cells. So it is by, by way of the delivery, while treating a large portion of the retina, it's not the, uh, not a hundred percent. However, what we, one thing that are for sure in this condition, you know, the, in terms of the area that's affected, it's also the same area where, you know, the, the, where our treatment is being delivered. So it's a target area and also what we know Based on the pathophysiology, so the uh, the and the science and the, and the biology is that we know with this condition there's an, in fact so called a, uh, a a structure function in dissociation. So what you have is the retina appears to be alive and functional, yet there's uh, a, a structurally uh, you know there vi uh, viable, but yet there's no function. So treating that target area allows uh, function to occur. So we do believe that it, we're treating the right areas and that's the area where, uh, you know, uh, where functions could, could, uh, uh, could occur again. And can the area change patient to patient? Is it, it could it, or, or because it's a specific gene, it's the same area every time, no matter who but the for the treat, is. For the treatment, it is treated in the, around the same area for each of the patients. In terms of the, you could imagine there could be some small geographic, you know, the uh, differences, but by and large, the areas affected, it's all, you know, it's all in that same area. And also the important thing is in terms of restoration of function, by, by improving the function in that area, uh, you know, we, we think you know, the substantial uh, vision can be restored. Okay, and we did have another question come in specific to CRISPR, so I'm gonna ask that as well. Is it possible to use CRISPR for delection mutation? For deletion? Well, some of the, just say, let me speak in, in general. So there are, there are you know, the, uh, um, you know, gene defects that are more complex in nature, right? So they would require some acrobatic, if you will. Some, uh, we, we have, you know, the methods where we, you know, we do it twice, you know, uh, and in the case of the uh, LCA-10, it's we can do a deletion or an inversion. So there are a number of ways in which we can do, we can do things. And what, what I mentioned in the case of LCA-10 is our first step. And we, we're doing many more complex, you know, the uh, maneuvers uh, these days. And in fact, we've, we're known for being able to do complex editing that other companies are just starting to do. Okay. So I think that's a great segue into um, Editas has exciting news to share about the brilliance phase one, two clinical trial of edit 101 for the treatment of Leber congenital amaurosis 10. So tell us about this treatment for people who have a SEP290 genetic variation. So the, the, the trial is a phase one, two uh, uh, early phase study. 
in, in, uh, the goal is to recruit about uh, 18 to 20 patients and to test the use of edit 101 in patients with, uh, with LCA10. Let's start with this, uh, you know, we will mention a number of times the, uh, the edit 101. Edit 101, it's a, you know, the, with the editing complex package into, uh, you know, into a, a viral vector and deliver subretinally as a one-time injection. So we hope this will be a, you know, the definitive and durable therapy for patients. It is a open label, single treatment study. So open label means that both the patients and the investors, including sponsor, know who gets what. And in this particular case, there is no blinding or randomization. Everyone gets treatment. So that, you know, sometimes there's concern that you one would get placebo and this is not the case. Part of the you know, issue that perhaps the you know, community need to be aware of is that the subretinal injection is a bit of a you know, interventional procedure. It's not something that's undertaken lightly. So therefore it is uh, you know, considered not acceptable to be uh, applying placebo. So in this case, every patient is treated. So patients are treated, you know, uh, and uh, there are actually five groups of patients, three in adults, two in, the, uh, in, uh, in kids and adolescents, 17 and younger. We have already, you know, the, those the first two cohorts uh, and we're moving on to treating the high dose adults and then the mid dose uh, ch uh, children. So uh, the study is still ongoing. Uh, and recently we, uh, we presented the data at the Retinal Disease Society and 2021, the symposium. Uh, and we released the information on the first six patients. While we have uh, disclosed that we have enrolled uh, a total of seven. Based on the information, what we see is that the therapy is well tolerated with minimal in, uh, in, uh, inflammation. Some of the side effects are what you expect with injection of this sort. For example, eye pain is one after, after surgery, it, uh, it's common. It, a little bit of inflammation, uh, again, it's also post-operative, a very com common occurrence, but not when it comes to you know, demonstrable inflammation, sometimes related to the, the viral vector. We ha actually have seen very minimal inflammation of that sort. In terms of the potential efficacy, it's uh, fairly exciting. Um, we found that the, well, the so to, to start off with, the data is limited. We've, uh, our, our first patient was followed for a total of 15 months. But because of the COVID issues, we won, we won, we had the issues in terms of following that patient for that whole, whole entire time when it comes to collecting all the information. And other patients in the, uh, we have up to nine months. And then in the second group, we have, pay, pay, we have results up to six months. So while the second patient in the first group showed actually improvements in both the visual acuity and maze, we couldn't uh, you know, tell whether or not that was a, a, uh, a drug defect because in this particular case, because of patient's baseline sort of the, you know, condition, and um, we also actually saw it, uh, it, it, you know, in the uh, part of the testing, what we call navigation maze, when, when patients have to sort of walk through a series of obstacles under different varying contrast and difficulty, as well as light level, uh, in all, uh, and see if there is an improvement, and that is functional testing. So what we have seen is that there's improvement in that particular patient, but in both eyes. 
So, uh, and we, we weren't able to tell whether that, that was a definitively uh, study effect. But in subsequent patient, especially in the patient who was uh, the first patient who, uh, who we have um, longer term the, you know, uh, follow up, we actually have seen improvements of the visual acuity, meaning that patient can uh, able to read the, the letters better. Also, there's improvement in the retinal sensitivity at, at a level that's con you know, considered clinically meaningful and also significant improvement in the patient's ability to navigate through a maze in the eye that was studied. So we have two patients, you know, uh, uh, in the total of, uh, you know, five patients who were looked at for the efficacy because we, we have to have at least three months of uh, follow-up data to, uh, to, in order for us to tell whether or not, you know, the patient can be scored for, you know, the efficacy findings. We believe we have at least two solid patients with, uh, with results that suggest that Edit 101 has uh, achieved the editing and that we have corresponding uh, improvements in the patient. So that's amazing. Yeah, it's the first, first time anyone has demonstrated uh, you know, the potential of editing uh, in, uh, in human eyes. Of course, like I said earlier, we've sort of dreamed about this since 2014, and we're very excited to share the data, even though it's fairly early. And one could ask, and I, I bet there's a question coming, where, where well, you see, it seems like only a few patients, is this real or not? One thing is, while we cannot, um, limitation of our type of treatment is, I'll be, be frank, we can't take out any someone's eye and biopsy it <laughs> and, and to see if, uh, you know, if, if light lights up with uh, Edit 101, right? You know, so therefore we have to do indirect testing. But with, with, five, of the six, uh, with five of the six patients, we've actually been following them in our natural history study. So these patients for a, uh, for, for a time of a year or, or more, been, been undergoing the same tests. So we have fairly reliable information about how they perform. And so we don't believe it's just because we introduce a needle, suddenly they get able to get through the maze and uh, improvement in their sensitivity and, uh, and seeing better. And these are just the adult patients. You don't have results yet for, for the um, 17 and younger, or do you? No, not yet. So uh, hopefully in the, in the future, we'll be uh, discussing that. Have you, have you done any treatments on 17 and younger? Uh, uh, 17 and younger, not yet. And when do you expect, are you recruiting for that still? Or do you we have- are, your we, are at, we are actively recruiting and we, we expect to, uh, uh, to start that very soon. Okay. Um, we did have some questions that came in and I'm just gonna, because they speak to what we're talking about right now. So uh, the first question is, is edit 101 limited to only SEP 290? The edit 101 is designed and developed for SEP 290. So yeah, uh, and for, for that uh, sole purpose, correct. And sort of a follow-up to that is, what is required to make this technology available to other IRD gene mutations? So with our platform in this so-called in vivo editing, so we are looking in ways in which we can use that to treat other forms of uh, inherited retinal disease. So, and we have a, a number of uh, programs that it's actually pursuing that. And uh, so e each of them ha has its uh, you know, own, um, you know, own requirements because no, no, no one disease is the same. No one the gene defect is the same. Like I mentioned earlier, sometimes you re really requires a lot of you know sort of uh, acrobats in in order to get in and make make the make the uh, necessary edits, right? You know. So, uh, but uh, fortunately, we actually our scientists are really talented and and good at that. But uh, uh, and then we hopefully you know we'll be able to take that forward to to, to test in the uh, in humans. I think that that's a a 
very common frustration among the patient community, and especially when it's parents talking about their kids who have LCA, where we heard a lot of it when RP, when Luxterna came out for RP65, and now as we're talking about this um, SEP290 and the, and the brilliance results and edit 101 is why, why can't you just apply this one type of treatment to the 26 other genetic mutations that we see within the LCA community? The, 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 the hard part is there's not at this time sort of plug and play. And as we start, started out in 2014 to up to where we are now, we only stood uh, in the early phase you know, and treated uh, a, a few patients. It's a long road. The, uh, for good reason, the regulatory path is a long one. You know, we are under the regulatory eyes, you know, the, ho the whole time, making sure that we have, we develop the right treatment and have the right process and the right quality so that the, each patient is really getting the same consistent, you know, medicine, right? So it's uh, from now to approval is another long one because we have to complete the study, complete the actual pivotal, pivotal trial in both adults and, uh, and kids before this could be approved. So each of the, you know, you can imagine we have to do this for each of the, um, uh, the defect uh, and you could, you could add up and it's a, um, it's a long, expensive and laborious exercise. And, uh, uh, and um, so, it's a commitment on our part. It's a commitment for uh, yet uh, you know f that you guys have to think about as well. It's not as you guys organizing, you know the uh, and uh, this right now. You appreciate that this is, none of this is easy. And, and what we can say is, uh, I, you know, I think we can sort of celebrate a success and the fact that there are options. And in the case of LCA ten, you know, hate to say this is this there's another option. Be it not in the you know the, uh, uh, gene editing that's out there, we hope we hope to be able to outperform, but that uh, time and results will, will will tell. Best case scenario, if everything goes perfect, how far away would um, Edit One Hundred One be from actual market? It will still be a few years, right? You know, and. Uh, so, uh, and that's, that's, a re that's a reality. And then depending on really discussion with the agency. So if you look at, you know, what happened to Lux Turner and, uh, and everyone else and on um, um, how long it takes for a, for a generically a drug to be approved, you're talking about, an, you know, um, let's say these days is probably 15, 20 years. Right, right. Um, one other question that came in specific to Edit 101 is, have you seen any increase in cataract formation? We, uh, we haven't. One thing, the sort of a, a bit of a disclaimer again is the, we, 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 uh, own, it's, it's early, but so far we have not seen any, uh, uh, any worsening. Um, so we, is that we want to talk a little bit about what else Editas is working on that's relevant to the rare retinal disease community. We do have um, folks here in the webinar who are interested in the TULP1 gene, LCA15, AIPL1, and of course, LCA10. And then obviously we have all of our other variations as well within the LCA community. Uh, what else is Editas working on these days? We are actually looking, uh, working on uh, H2A, a, a gene, uh, a condition where there's an abnormality in the Usherin protein. We're also looking at a so-called RP4, retinitis pigmentosa 4, where the gene defects in the uh, in rhodopsin. Um, and we are all, uh, we're also looking at other potential targets as well, but, but not, uh, not specifically for another uh, LCA defect. How many projects do you have going all at once? Well, we ha we have quite a few. Uh, you know, uh, scientists are very active in the in exploring options. So that, that that's some some of it we have we have to keep uh, you know sort of confidential. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So we did have a question that was submitted in advance and it's kind of long, so bear with me. Um, I understand that if you go through CRISPR treatment and it doesn't work, you won't be able to do another treatment because of the way it enters into your system. The next time your system will recognize it and fight it off. Is this true? And is there anything changing in the way that these can be applied so that someone can have more than one chance? So let's sort of step back a bit. But one thing is I want to uh, say again, it's a privilege to have uh, patients sort of participate in our, uh, in our journey together. And without the patients, you know, the, nothing can succeed. So the, and, you, and your participation is, uh, is vital. Um, when it comes to specifically for whether or not that you, one can undergo one or multiple, uh, you know, the investigation, you have to look at relatively speaking, sort of how, how much is out there and whether or not, uh, you know, the, in one condition, you even can wait for another study, right? And then the, the other thing in, in this particular question, you know, is related to perhaps the viral vector where it's known to uh, induce inflammation or you can get an immune reaction from it. There are newer, uh, first of all, newer vectors available. And also if, if in the, in theory, you are to undergo another therapy, perhaps not in the eyes or elsewhere, the, it, the vector may not be the same. So you may not mount the same response. But one thing, you know, uh, one has to bear in mind that when, when you inject into the eye and subretinally, it does alter the anatomy. So it's right now not common practice to do a second subretinal injection. So that may be one of the more important limitations. Uh, and things could change uh, when the delivery method uh, changes, even for the viral vector that may change. But then the question is whether or not you can wait that long. And that's all, always a, 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 a difficult question. Like you were asking earlier, can I wait till this is approved before you know, I undergo the, and the uh, treatment with a, with a approved product? And then you also ask, well, about the, why do we push to treat kids? It's because, you know, in theory, the closer you are to the time of your, you know, impairment of your vision or the loss of it, perhaps more likely is it that you're going to gain that, gain uh, the function back, or you can make you, uh, and, and have a more meaningful recovery. We don't know that for sure, um, but there's, there's good reason to, to think it's reasonable to, to believe that. So, um, so you, have to, you have to really think about you know, what chances one wants to take. And the important thing is, should you be interested in any kind of investigation, make sure you spend the time and talk to the treating physician and make sure these questions are answered. Right, right. Um, do you want to put up your slide about... Um... Uh, yes. Let's do that. We can sort of, you can sort of talk us through the whole process. So this is a, this is, I would say, this is the only kind of uh, design and promotional site I will I'll put up. This, uh, you know, describes what our brilliant study is. That is a safety and efficacy study with close monitoring for patients of three you know, uh, 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 up to, you know, uh, adulthood. And it's uh, right now running across the, uh, across the US. And if you're interested, you can contact us either by email, patients at editorsmed.com or call us, call us at 617-419-0007. And maybe I'll just go, go to the next slide and then we'll stop sharing is, uh, um, again, I want to make sure it's not promotional in nature, but I do, uh, I am, uh, I do find this a very inspiring story. It's one of our patients that volunteered to um, 
to the interview with the NPR. So you can find a series of uh, stories on the NPR uh, on their website. And these are words actually from, from NPR, not, not from Editor's Medicine. Uh, the, the reason why I find this very inspiring is this particular patient saw improvement in her vision and celebrated by, uh, by coloring her, her hair green uh, because she saw color uh, again, which, which she thought was thrilling and wanted to, everyone to see. And she did that by turning her hair green. So this, was not, this is not a Photoshop trick. This is just what she wanted to do. Uh, and I, I, I find that very inspiring. Again, it, our, uh, our study is only ongoing and uh, we, you know, the results could be variable. Okay, and now I'll, I'll stop, get back in the... All right, and we have a couple of more questions that came in. The first one is, what is the vector you are currently using? We are using the um, adenovirus, you know, a, as, our, as our vector, which is actually uh, fairly commonly used. The one we are using has a particular predilection for the eyes. We believe it's a highly uh, e uh, efficient and it helps with the editing in the eyes. And do participants in your trial have to go on immune response treatment? The only treatment that they will they need, uh, they will get as part of the investigation is following the uh, following the immediate treatment. They will get a short course of uh, oral steroids, and in some cases they may get some eye drops as well. and And that's all the uh, in, uh, in, immunomodulating therapy they will ever get, which is a you know a, 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 this day and age a uh, very fairly minimal treatment. And that's, uh, by the way, is prophylactic. Um, okay, so there's a follow-up. I'm not sure what it's a follow-up to, but I must, the, the question is, which one, AAV5 or AAV8? It's AAV5. Sounds like yeah. so, someone from the, someone in the industry. <laughs> Um, there might be some competition in this in this yeah, webinar. I'm not sure. Um, for, uh, one thing I would mention to you know the, for the patient question again the, the question about the uh, you know whether it need to be treated it's a is a, 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 a extremely good one. I forgot to mention that you know sometimes one needs to think about the um, you know the, the fact that the you know treatment in a prior study just in it, more generically could what sometimes what we say is confound the results on another. So for example, if you respond or not respond or have a side effects that may carry over and affect a different investigation. So sometimes that's frowned upon. And then the other is if, any, if, ever, if you have hesitation, nature does offer us two eyes. <laughs> and so we do treat just one at a time, only in later phase, when we know that the uh, treatment is likely to be of benefit, do we treat both eyes? All right, well, that's, that's good to know. Dr. Chen, I wanna close out today with, um, just talk to us a little bit about what keeps you going uh, in, this, in this world that, that you work in of rare disease and, and working on treatments because it is a slow process and it is very heavy, heavily regulated and it can be, it, there are failures that are more common than successes. So, so what keeps you going? Yeah, there are days that are very frustrating. And uh, there's always an air uh, in life that's uh, up and down. And, but I call uh, myself blessed having a chance to make a difference in someone's life and uh, have done it more than once. So it's all about the patients. It's all about the smiles that you, you know, we, we end up seeing and then the changes we uh, end up making to imagine just, just, just like I um, you know, show the, the picture of that particular smiling patient with the green hair, that uh, makes a world of difference and makes it all worthwhile. Well, we're so appreciative of the work that you and your team at Editas do and everybody in the, in the research and the, and the pharma 
uh, fields that work on LCA treatments every day. We thank you very much for your time today. I know you travel a ton, you, you are very busy and we're very grateful that we were able to pin you down for this short amount of time. Yeah, thank you very much again. Appreciate uh, all, all, you, all you doing and all your, uh, and your organization and our, allowing us a chance to share a bit of news uh, you know, with, with, your, uh, with your group and the patients. All right, thank you. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks everyone. Okay. Take care, bye-bye.